guys. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, today we have a special colloquium where we have two speakers presenting from Syracuse University, uh, Professor Georgia Manzel and Craig Kathleen. Um, so first we're going to have a talk by Professor Manzel, um, where she's going to talk about LIGO detectors. And she comes um, originally from Australia, where she completed her PhD before completing postdocs at MIT and Caltech and uh, LIGO. And uh, now she is an assistant professor at Syracuse in the physics department. So please help me in welcoming Georgia. Uh, thanks to everyone who's showing me in the lab, so uh, showing me to LLE, especially Rob, who's been snooping with them and like energizing to see all the objects that you guys Really excited to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about the advanced LIGO detectors in November 4, which is the observing run that we're doing right now. Um, it's a, uh, a lot of kind of fluff in this talk, but if that's something you want me to expand on, you can just interrupt. Like, that's totally fine. Happy to take questions if that's something to feel like interesting. Uh, so, overview of my talk, I'm going to Tell you about me, I'll do a to that, and then I'll have some background on what gravitational waves are, gravitational wave detectors, and the technologies that go into these large scale interferometers. We're going to talk about LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, and then I will talk about the sensitivity that our gravitational wave detectors have reached for the current observing run, or four. I'll talk a little bit about squeeze light because that's my favorite thing, and a little bit about noise hunting. And then uh, I'll tell you about, about what the experiments that I'm setting up at Syracuse University are right now. So, uh, as Rob said, I do my PhD uh, in Australia at ANU, Australian National University. And the, the focus of my project was on squeeze light for future gravitational detectors. So, I worked with two micron squeeze light. Um, and then I took a postdoc at, at LIGO Hanford Observatory and MIT. And so in the lead up to the observing runs, I worked on detector commissioning on getting the gravitational wave detector to its sensitivity target. And then once we go into observing mode, we have these periods of upgrade and then observing. Once you go into observing mode, uh, I worked on developing um, some hardware for future observing runs. So when the when the check is observing, it's less it's exciting for the data analysts, but less exciting for the instrumental. So um, that's when I would go to MIT and work in the lab there. And then as of March this year, I've been at Syracuse University, just a short hour and 25 minute drive from here. If you guys want to come and check it out. <laughs> um, and there I've been starting to set up some labs for instrumentation for current and future gravitational techniques. So that's okay. So it's Canberra, ANU, and then I'm going to be Lago Hanford out in the desert. And then it's a photo of the orange, the beloved mascot of Syracuse University. <laughs> so, uh, a little bit about gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are ripples in space time produced by accelerating masses with a non constant quadrupole moment. So, the kinds of signals that we're typically observing are from compact binary coalescences. Um, two black holes, two neutron stars, the black hole and a neutron star combining, <laughs> uh, merging and combining and becoming one typically black hole. Uh, space time is stiff. And so uh, the, the length changes, the perturbations in space time that are produced by these kinds of events are very, very small. We're looking at Length changes on the order of 10 to the minus 18 meters over a kilometer baseline. And so to detect gravitational waves, we need to measure extremely small displacements of the test. Map. So how do we do this? Uh, oh, yeah, I said 21 meters diameter, 18 meters diameter. Uh, we use lasers. <laughs> so uh, the, the LIGO detectors and also the Virgo detector in Italy I uh, have a Michelson interferometer topology. Our test masses are large suspended optics. Um, we need very uh, serious seismic isolation and multiple stages of pendulum to suspend our test masses to isolate them from any ground motion. Um, 
We use kilometer scale arms, so four kilometer long arms, um, to increase that strain sensitivity. What we're really looking for is a, a change in length over a length that is induced by a gravitational wave. The arms are in ultra high vacuum. We operate on a dark fringe, so we're using uh, structured interference at the dark port to to be very sensitive to a differential change in our arm lengths. And we also have high circulating power, so uh, we have arm cavities with um, hundreds of kilowatts circulating in them. And I didn't mention this, but so on this slide, we have the displacement that a, that a ring of test masses would experience as a gravitational wave passes through. So um, this induces in, in the L-shaped Michelson a differential arm distance. And this is a picture of one of our test masses. Uh, I, so when we first went on these lab tours today, we started out looking at a lot of like on-ship stuff. I was like, oh, these guys are going to be blown away by this giant test mass. And then we went to LLE, where everything is also huge. So, but, so we have uh, human-sized mirrors, um, and you can see some of the suspension. So like, this is a penultimate mass, and the test mass was suspended on a few silica fibers from this one, and then there's for total stage of suspension. That's equal to scale. So the optical layout of a gravitational wave detector, so I said it's a Michelson, but it's actually technically a fabri perot uh, dual recycled Michelson. So we have our pre-stabilized laser, which starts out as a, a two-watt end probe. This is then amplified uh, through successive uh, solid-state amplifier um, uh, amplifiers, uh, and then we have a uh, reference cavity for frequency stabilization and the pre-mode cleaner that is used in the intensity stabilization. There's the input mode cleaner, which on this diagram is weirdly huge. <laughs> it's a 30 meter cavity compared to the full column long arm, so it's not to scale. Um, and this just cleans up the beam before we send it into the main interferometer. We have a power recycling mirror for the beam splitter. This just sends any light that's coming back towards the laser uh, recycles it back into the interferometer. And then we have the two interferometer arms, and these are the four kilometer cavity. At the output port, we have a signal recycling mirror that just effectively broadens the bandwidth of our detector so that we can be sensitive from on the order of 10 hertz out to several kilohertz, which is where we're looking for gravitational wave signals. Uh, we have a Faraday isolator on the output. And then uh, the detector, the signal then goes to the detection port here, where we have um, some photodiodes that we sum together, <laughs> and then look in that data for the corresponding like chirp of a compact binary bullet. And then I'm going to talk about this either in stuff later, but what we're effectively doing is engineering the vacuum state that goes back in the dark port of the interferometer to uh, reduce noise in the phase quadrature. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you about that later. So here's a nice picture of a uh, like Livingston Observatory and also like a Hanford Observatory. Livingston is in uh, Louisiana and uh, Hanford is out in Eastern Washington. Um, if you're ever in one of these places, I highly recommend going and checking them out. Uh, we have um, Outreach center there, and this is really impressive to see these large scale different It's really cool. I have a couple of slides that I stole from my friend. <laughs> so, <laughs> obligatory GW 1509 14 slides. So, in 2015, uh, the LIGO detectors turned on for the first observing run after an upgrade to the advanced LIGO detectors and immediately pretty much saw a signal from a compact binary coalescence, two black holes merging um, in a very high signal to noise ratio. So we have like the animation of the two black holes combining here. Um, the strain was pretty much as predicted as 10 to minus 21. Um, and then we have the waveform that's showing in our data. So this is strain versus time. And then the Hanford and Livingston data time shifted to the overlap with each other. So this was a really beautiful result. And also uh, uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2015 was awarded to uh, Rewise, Barry Barish, and Kip Thorne for their 
contributions to um for, for, for making Lego uh work and continuing it. Um in 2017, uh we got a signal from uh binary and neutron star merger. Uh so this was GW170017. This is a sort of video where we see in the top one is gamma ray signals and in the bottom is gravitational wave. And so we have this nice chirp in our data for binary neutron stars. They're lighter than the black holes we see. They're in our detection for a longer period of time. Um, and then pretty much straight after the merger is detected in gravitational waves, it's also detected it's also like a blip in the gamma range. So that's awesome to see. Um, we were able to uh, localize this event pretty well in the sky compared to um, the, the previous events that I talked talk about, especially like 15 and 14, because we had three detectors online for this. So the two LIGO detectors and the Virgo detector in Italy. Um, so then we were able to send out uh, alert to our electromagnetic astronomer colleagues and they looked where this signal was coming from and actually saw uh, an increase in the, uh, they saw like a blip, uh, you can kind of see this idea, that uh, came up in gamma rays, x-rays, UV, optical, IR, and radio, and then slowly faded away over time. So this is a, a an awesome like example of multi-messenger astronomy where you see something in gravitational waves, you see it in optical and regular in, in electromagnetic telescopes, and that allows you to do some really cool science. And so it's not just those two detections. Um, we have been observing now. Um, so there was observing on three uh, in 2019 to 2020, and now we're doing observing on four. Um, and we are starting to collect uh, a large population of stellar mass black holes. So this plot just shows in the blue, the LIGO, Virgo, and Carver black holes that we've detected. Uh, the orange is the neutron stars that we've detected. There's some intriguing uh, uh, component masses that have kind of been the band gap between neutron stars and black holes that we're not entirely sure what those are. Um, and also some like pretty heavy, like 100 plus solar mass black holes in the um, the resulting mass. So we're starting to learn more about black holes across the universe uh, using gravitational waves, and um, that's great. So uh, observing round two to observing round four, as I mentioned, we three ran from 2019 to 2020. Uh, the median binary neutron star sensitivity, the range in the universe to which we are sensitive to a binary neutron star, is on the order of uh, 120 megaparsecs for the LIGO detectors and 50 megaparsecs for the Virgo detector. During this observing run, we got 79 new detections, plus the 11 from row 3, oh, sorry, 01 and 02. So we have like 90 total GW detections that uh, were on that plot I showed on the previous slide. And uh, during O3, we're also uh, doing quantum enhanced um, interferometry. So we're injecting squeezy states into our detector and using these squeeze states to improve our shot match. So many of the upgrades for O4 were targeting improvements in sensitivity um, uh, across the whole frequency band, honestly, so the low frequency and high frequency sensitivity. So some of the upgrades we did were a filter cavity installed for frequency dependent squeezing, and this was the, the biggest upgrade between O3 and O4. Um, and I'll show you some slides on, on that. Uh, we also uh, upgraded our pre-stabilized laser system so we can get to a higher power uh, injected into the interferometer. Um, we replaced uh, some end test masses at Livingston and an input test mass at Hanford because uh, we had some issues with scattering and also absorbers in the coating of the test mass, uh, heating up and then uh, scattering light out of our nice uh, Gaussian beam. Um, and we also uh, replaced some of our auxiliary cavities. So here's a plot of the uh, strain sensitivity versus frequency. Um, and this one's for Livingston. Um, so in O3, they were sitting around 130 megaparsecs and 
the upgrades for, for targeted uh, the shot noise at high frequency, that's what's in the source up here, uh, technical noise in the middle, and also uh, radiation pressure noise, and other technical noise that's the lipid acid. So I keep like alluding to squeezing, but I haven't really explained it. So, um, oh, sorry, the, the slide is kind of a little at the bottom. Um, but the gravitational wave detectors are limited by, broadly limited by quantum noise. We also have the technical noises that um, I mentioned before. Uh, but so um, since we're measuring like a phase shift uh, or a, a test mass displacement, which turns into a phase shift at the output of our detector, um, oh, sorry, a phase shift uh, in the arms and uh, a power change at the output of the detector, it's inherently a, a phase measurement, and so we're limited by shot rates, the counting statistics of our photons. Um, but we also, uh, at low frequency, is limited by um, the momentum imparted by our photons to our test masses, uh, so quantum radiation pressure points. You know, three radiation pressure noise was kind of buried under technical noises. Um, so we got away with injecting just phase squeeze light to improve our sensitivity. Um, and what squeezing is, is where you manipulate the uncertainty principle to take the noise from the quadrature that you're trying to measure and put it in the quadrature that you don't care about. So light has the uh, phase and amplitude quadratures, which are associated with the shot noise and radiation pressure noise in this case. And so we injected phase squeezing across the whole detector sensitivity. Um, how we do this is we use an uh, optical parametric oscillator. Um, so we, all the LIGO uh, optics are at 1064. So we pump this OPO at 532 um, and generate our um, our entangled protons at, at 1064 and then inject them in the dark closing spectrometer. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's kind of a about this side. <laughs> a little vortex cavity with a crystal in the middle. And for four, our technical noise is low enough that if we injected phase squeezing everywhere, we would make our shot noise better, but our radiation pressure noise significantly worse, such that it would be limiting our sensitivity. So to get around that, we installed a 300 meter long filter cavity with a line width of about 80 hertz. We reflect our squeeze state off the filter cavity. And then uh, because of the phase rotation that it gets on that reflection, we can generate phase squeezing at high frequency and amplitude squeezing at low frequency. And it was kind of funny to me that like to get this quantum engineered state to improve the detector, like this very delicate, like squeezing rotation. What it really comes down to is pouring 300 meters of concrete and building a new vacuum tube to go onto this. It's a very uh, facilities level um, fix to a, a like quantum mechanics problem, uh, but it works. So uh, between 03 and 04, we installed a 300 meter long cavity with new building. <laughs> The mirrors have uh, you know, the usual suspensions and seismic isolation. We have all these auxiliary optics for controlling the filter cavity. Um, we also installed some active mode matching optics. We have changeable radius of curvature mirrors so that we can get our beams well matched to the interferometer mode. And we needed a bunch of, well, a couple of new uh, low loss parity isolated. And this is the nice result from this one. So uh, it works. <laughs> Um, so the black trace here is with no squeezing. Uh, this is our, again, Livingston strain sensitivity as a function of frequency. And then the green is when we inject frequency independent squeezing, just phase squeezing across the whole band. So the noise goes down at high frequency, and the radiation pressure noise becomes so much worse that it is totally dominant up to over 200 hertz. Um, so then we take our frequency independent squeeze state and we lock the filter cavity and reflect it off the filter cavity. And we have this broadband improvement, even down to like 50 or 60 hertz, even a little bit lower, a little bit of improvement here too. <laughs> um, and so this 
makes the detector more sensitive everywhere, and it works. It was. So some of the other commissioning highlights for Earth 4 I, I mentioned some of these already, but we increased the input power and worked a lot on the stability. So we have a lot of auxiliary control loops to control the length of the different cavities in LIGO and also that angular pointing of all these masses. So there was a significant effort to improve the noise in those auxiliary control loops. Uh, we replaced test masses with point absorber. Um, we mitigated some scattered light sources um, because all the LIGO detectors are sensitive in the audio band. Any like sources of scatter that then reflect beams like off the the chamber walls or other like unsecondary things um, can couple back into the interferometer and cause uh, peaks in our spectrum at these acoustic resonances. So um, scattered light is a, a real problem for us. We also identified some grounding noise at Hanford. Not very spicy, I know, but like <laughs> uh, technically interesting that uh, we're limited by fluctuations in the grounding potential at one of our end stations. Um, and we also worked on online noise subtraction for different sources of noise that we can witness uh, through uh, our auxiliary channels. And so this is a newish plot of the O4A status. So O4 started in May of this year, and uh, we've been observing since then. And so blue is the Livingston sensitivity in this one. They're sitting at around 160 plus megaparsecs, and Hanford is the red here. So you can see they're quite similar eye frequency. Uh, a lot of the lines are similar between the two sites. And then at low frequency, Hanford still has excess noise, especially the very low frequency is below like 30 hertz or so. Do you think that this like difference would make a bigger impact on the binary neutron star range? But I think that because it's all very low frequency, uh, that doesn't contribute so much to the binary neutron star range. But um, yeah, it's still a, a huge result to be reaching out to 160 megapartners from that world. So um, this plot on the left is just the, that range again, the angle average range as a function of time from the start of O3. And you can see the Hanford started out kind of around 130 and then gradually over the last um, 23 weeks has uh, improved the sensitivity. A lot of this is uh, attributed to upgrades to the squeeze light system. So, uh, this is kind of crazy, but we had to translate our crystal in the OPO, in the optical parametric oscillator. Uh, and it, we were going through like a, a high loss spot in the crystal. And so moving the crystal <laughs> converts to a binary neutron star range. Um, uh, so that gave some extra range there. And then there's also improved feed forward from some of our auxiliary loops into our um, differential arm length loop. Um, we won't talk about that too much. Um, so then, yeah, the pie charts on the right are just showing uh, the GD cycle. You can see that we're observing around 70 to 75% of the time with each individual detector. Um, and we spend some time locked but not observing, and that's when the fun stuff happens, where we look for noises and translate crystals and stuff like that. And then some other fraction of the time is not locked either for maintenance or if there's a big earthquake. Or, uh, at least recently, there was logging activity near the end station, one of their sites, which made it hard for them to acquire a lock. Um, so sometimes uh, reasons like that too. So in March, Craig and I moved to Syracuse to start setting up our labs there and be junior faculty and teach and do stuff like that. Um, so at Syracuse, there's also Stefan Bomo, who's a professor working on gravitational instrumentation as well. Um, and so some of the stuff that we're doing, uh, typically what we want to do is work on like technologies for the current detectors or future detectors that you can do in a tabletop experiment and then hopefully one day put something in the detector or develop something new for future gravitational detectors. So Stefan's group, um, 
They have a couple of experiments looking at coding thermal noise, so just Brownian motion in the coatings that we want to put on our ice masses. Um, and they have a room temperature and cryogenic version of these uh, coding thermal noise measurements. Um, he's also got a heat camera, so he's uh, imaging the sideband fields. We have a lot of sidebands that we use for blocking different uh, controls in the interferometer. And sometimes it's hard to know what they're doing when they go into the cavity. And so um, we need phase cameras to image those. Craig is working on frequency noise suppression for future detectors. And I think that's going to be uh, the bulk of his talk in two minutes time. <laughs> and he's also working on our high power fixed phaser cavity, um, which is really interesting. Um, and I have two experiments. I'm building a squeeze light source for future gravitational wave detectors. And I've also started working on an electrostatic damper for the suspension fibers uh, for potentially a O5 upgrade to the current detectors. So our new labs are under construction right now. This is what they looked like when we left Syracuse uh, last week. <laughs> And then uh, while this is happening, I'm using some of Stefan's lab space to work on that fiber mode damper I mentioned. So this is a fiber that we pulled in house. And then we have a little electrode set up here to try to damp the, the violin mode, like literally like the guitar string mode of this few silica fiber. And this is my grad student planning what our squeeze zone might look like. Um, and that's all I got. Thank you so much. So we do have time for a couple questions uh, before Craig's talk. Uh, Javier? Yeah. Uh, so when you were showing your sensitivity plots, uh, what causes the, the big spikes that are in? Like, yeah. Because uh, those are very, really, very interesting. Yeah, so some of these lines are uh, self-inflicted <laughs> and some of them are not. So actually uh, the lines, the biggest ones here are like 500 hertz and one kilohertz and 1,500. Uh, those are the violin modes that we are trying to damp with the electrostatic damp. So those ones, I have a personal vendetta I want to crush. Uh, <laughs> Partly because they take so much commissioning time to to understand what frequencies they're at. Every fiber has uh, eight eight modes. Um, sorry, every, every test mass has four fibers, and every fiber is an ellipse. So there's two modes for the two axes of the ellipse. And so finding these and 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 yeah, trying to like reduce them is uh, important because if they get too excited, then we can't lock it from. So that's what those are. There's a couple of lines that we inject for calibration, and we also have some dither lock loops where we deliberately dither an optic and then use that to generate an error signal. Well. So some of our lower frequency lines are, I think, dither lines for that um, system. There's a few, like, see, there's some, like, lumpier looking ones, broader looking ones. Those could be scatter, scatter by, um, there's obviously 60 hertz um, from the mains of 120, 180. Um, yeah, there's a few other, there's a few different lines also in the kilohertz range. Um, yeah, but they're kind of a mix, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. And so you mentioned that you work on like a new squeezer. <laughs> and so like you have consideration of fiber, is it also a vacuum squeezer or because you're using fiber is it like a squeezer? Uh, sorry, can you is, is it also like producing vacuum squeeze states or does it produce? Yeah, I think that for, for improving the gravitational detector, we typically want to do squeeze vacuum and not the bright squeeze states. Um, but I think that's the cleanest way to do it is to inject our squeeze vacuum in the output of the detector. So it's the same concept. Um, there's just a few things. So right now, we're getting uh, 5 dB of like improvement with the squeezer, but for future detectors, we obviously promise more. So we need to hunt down sources of loss. We have also some interesting like frequency dependent loss, which I think is due to mode mismatch 
between our various upper cavity. Um, so I want to characterize that for future detected. Um, yeah, that's the kind of stuff we'll be looking into. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Yeah. And then next up, we have Dr. Craig Catlin, who also uh, comes to Syracuse University by way of a postdoc at um, Ligo Hanifer. Um, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about the design that he's going through for the next generation of Ligo detectors. Yep. Thank you. And thanks. Just, yeah, so first, thanks, uh, Rob and John, for um, putting us all together and uh, for getting us here. And um, should I like uh, share? Share, share on video? When you share your screen, uh, the folks on Zoom are seeing the presenter there. view. So if there's a way to share the screen, uh, perfect. Very good. Thank you. Right. Well, just, okay, I'll go. Good. Okay. So yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit more about what's going what's going on with us uh, at Syracuse. And um, so Georgia just gave you the state of the art, um, and I will tell you about what's next. How do you improve on you know advanced LIGO, and what are we going to? Where are we going uh, in particular? And what is Cotton Explorer? And you guys can feel free to ask questions as well. I think Georgia has a prize for the person who asked the best question. So, um, very good. So. <laughs> Can I move this thing? Yeah. Oh, I, well, you know, I don't, I don't know very much. Push it all the way to the top. To top. Oh, okay. Good enough. <laughs> okay. I'll just read it. What is Cosmic Explorer? So, Cosmic Explorer is um, the US based, you know, third generation gravitational wave observatory. And so, there's also Einstein Telescope that's being designed for in, in Europe. Um, and so this is sort of the you know competitor to that, and it's the same. It's not supposed to be a competition, of course, but obviously we're putting together a design. They're putting they're a little bit further ahead than us, and so George and I are part of the Cosmic Explorer, this optical design team. Um, people who have experience with um, you know advanced LIGO, and you know who are we're supposed to put together some kind of workable design that you know we can start working on. And uh, you know, decide which parts need more R and D, what parts need you know a little bit less. Um, you know that we think are ready to go. And so, um, C's primary feature is that it is hella long. It is forty kilometers long, and so that is ten times longer than advanced LIGO. And so we, we you know, I don't know. The field of gravitational wave astronomy is about like thirty years old when Ray Weiss sort of invented it, and like at this point, the best we still got is make it longer, make it long. And so that's what we're doing. And um, there's a whole bunch of technical challenges, which comes with making it 40 kilometers long. Uh, but our goal is going to be detect every black hole merger. And... <laughs> Not ambitious at all. Okay. No. Uh, all right. So yeah, motivation. Why do I want to detect every black hole in the universe? So. Here uh, is a very complex plot that's made by another person who was just hired at Syracuse, Alex Nitz. He's on the data analysis side. Um, but just parsing this together, first of all, the x-axis is total binary mass, and the y-axis is redshift, or time. And so on the right here, we have a cute little diagram with you know, the Big Bang and the C and D, you know, the formation of you know, re the first atoms reionization that happens about 500 million years after the uh, you know, Big Bang. So uh, that's the era, you know, where the first stars started to form. And the idea is this, this blue curve that says C40 on it, out of all of these traces, the things underneath that curve are what CE40, the 40 kilometer CE detector, is going to be able to see, all right? And so there is just a whole ton of things on the spot that we're going to be able to detect. Um, in particular, we see uh, some things that we've already detected. So GW170817 um, is the neutron star collision that we detected with advanced LIGO. Uh, here's the first detection, GW150914. Here's our heaviest detection, GW190. Uh, oh, it doesn't matter what it is. Our heaviest detection, first detection, neutron star detection. Those are the ones that we had from advanced LIGO. Um, but clearly, there's way, way more that we're missing. And that's what we want to catch. 
And so these are some populations of black holes in the gray at NSBHs, uh, neutron star binary black hole mergers, uh, where we have a uh, you know, heavy and very light mass coming together. And then there's the gold over there is uh, neutron stars. Uh, little stars in there are gamma ray bursts that we've detected. Um, and so hopefully, you know, in the future, we'll be able to always be detecting the gravitational wave associated with all of those gamma ray bursts, right? Um, there's other things up here, pop three black holes. And so population three stars are the earliest stars. So these are the ones which form uh, when the universe is only 500 million years old. And the idea behind that is that you're able to, you know, detect the black holes which are associated with the most massive stars, which were made of only hydrogen and helium, which formed, you know, back in the, in the very, very early days of the universe. And so something we want to understand is how these things formed, uh, how black holes formed, how um, and what those populations are uh, throughout the universe. So, how did supermassive black holes like those in the center of our galaxy form? Um, all of these are sort of open questions. We don't really have good handles on what the answers are. With CE, that all starts to change. So we're able to make way, way, way more detections, first of all. Um, uh, detections with higher SNR, that's what these other curves on the spot are. Um, as you go closer, of course, the SNR starts to increase significantly. So the point you're making SNR 1,000 detections which is something we haven't really approached in, in advanced LIGO yet. So um, this is just sort of motivating what we want to learn. Um, but uh, what do we detect exactly? So we have this uh, uh, simulation here. I wonder if everybody on, online can still see this. I hope we are able to. Uh, it's just playing on my, it's just playing on my thing, but um, the, the sound of these, but this is the neutron star simulation. So they start to come over. This is vastly slow down. And then they collide. And then they start to shoot off the jets. And here's the ejector from the neutron star. And you can see the jet propagating out. This is sort of like going um, in either direction, with the, you know, accelerated by the extreme uh, energy so associated with the collision. We, this is something we call a gamma ray burst. We're able to see those, obviously, with our gamma rays also in space. And the whole idea is that we have uh, the gamma ray bursts and the gravitational wave detections that we, we talked about earlier. So let's uh, go back here. <laughs> um, so bam. And so George already showed you this plot, but I'll just go over it briefly again. On this plot here, we have the gravitational wave chirp. And so we move in time um, and up in frequency as the binary and neutron starts to get closer and closer together throughout the antiviral and when they hit each other. Uh, they, they merge right here, and then two seconds later, you detect the gamma ray burst from that, uh, uh, from that kilonova. And so, you know, we detected this, and then two seconds later, we detected. So, LIGO detects the binary neutron star merger and gravitational waves. You know, in Fermi and all of these gamma ray telescopes, integral, um, you know, detect the gamma ray burst, but both of these have sort of loose sky localization. Um, so we're not able to tell you exactly where in the sky it came from, and neither are the GRD people. So what followed was an intense optical follow-up campaign. Everybody's just, you know, taking their telescope and just taking pictures in the most likely lo locations on the sky. And 11 hours later, they found it. And so uh, somebody took a picture of this galaxy in BC 4993, and they saw this uh, transient here. So here's the galaxy. And then it boxed in is where the transient is. And on this, on the top left, or on the top right is where the, how the transient sort of darkened. You can still see it with your naked eye though. Um, um, and zooming down, well, you can't see it with your naked eye because it's too dim, but like with a telescope zoomed in on it, you could have seen it with your naked eye. Um, and so that's what you see um, coming from this galaxy. So we were able to find it. What can you learn from stuff like that when you can actually do this optical transient, you know, follow-up? So binary, we learned that binary neutron stars are the forge of the universe. What do I mean by that? It means that the optical follow-up observed are process nucleosynthesis occurring in the ejecta, so that blue stuff that came out of the neutron star merger uh, was just pure neutrons, super rich neutron environment. So these super heavy atoms our nuclei are basically forming in that ejecta. And as those uh, nuclei come together, they start to decay into protons and they go back to um, 
uh, stable stable isotopes. And so what they actually look at here is these light spectra. These are all spectra taken, taken from that location on the sky in sort of the optical range. So here's one, um, so, so here's one micron, that's uh, uh, one inch, that's that's what we work in in uh, LIGO. So this is infrared. And so we here basically have the visible light range uh, up to the near infrared. And these numbers in bold are these uh, days after the merger. And so here we have 1.5, 2.5 days later, um, you know, and so on and so forth. And on the left is just the intensity. And so what you see is it's super bright immediately after the um, detection, right? That makes sense. But then it starts to decay. The spectra starts to decay. And it has these characteristic clumps here. Um, I don't know. Here we go. Yeah, here's some characteristic clumps here, which uh, comes from that neutrons rich material decaying down into this, uh, they don't die down as fast as they you know, nominally should. So that tells us that the R process is happening, okay? And then after a while, they cave down, and uh, still people are making follow-ups of radio waves, uh, but the optical waves sort of died out after about uh, this sort of time, after about a month. So what does this mean? It tells us something that people long thought was that merging neutron stars are responsible for creating the super heavy elements in our universe, especially the ones that we find on Earth. So uranium, almost purely synthesized in a merging neutron, neutron star. It's too heavy to be formed by, you know, supernovae or, um, you know, star, heavy stars uh, synthesizing these elements and then exploding apart. And so uh, it's telling us a lot, a lot more about where elements come from in the universe. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. We can learn way, way, way more once we are able to make more detections like this, there's been no subsequent uh, detections like this because binary and neutron star emerges that we can detect are uh, much less frequent. And even when we do make them, it's hard to, you know, also have the optical follow-up from the, you know, GRV. Like the, the jet has to be aligned at Earth and, you know, you have to be able to take a picture of the right part of the sky to catch the transient. And, uh, black holes don't do this, right? Because those guys, um, they absorb light and they don't emit anything. So, you know, neutron stars are a very, very special source for us. They tell us a lot about what's going on in the universe. And so this is sort of, uh, I don't know how much I'm going to, okay, 15 minutes. All right. So, yeah, this is just sort of an overview slide of where we're going, what we want to do with cosmic explorer detections. Uh, we want to nail down black hole populations. We want to, uh, you know, resolve uh, gravitational waves from sources with distances greater than redshift 10, which is sort of the range that JWST, uh, James Webb Space Telescope, is going to be able to observe. But they aren't going to be able to observe singular sources from that kind of distance, right? They can look at entire galaxies of pop three stars, um, you know, that's massively redshifted, obviously, into the far infrared, but they'll still be able to detect that kind of stuff. But we will be able to see singular sources from galaxies that far away. With localized nearby neutron star sources with incredible precision and pre precision, I guess they do incredible in there. Um, and, you know, and it allows for early warning. So these detections they come in band, um, you know, at the two hertz regime, and then they merge at uh, you know a thousand hertz or something like that. And so if you if 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 uh, uh, CE is actually working as advertised, we should be able to make the early detection. We see them in spiraling, and then we're able to say, okay, this will merge maybe in a few hours, and we can you know, tell our optical telescopes to zoom in and look so they can catch that um, optical follow-up straight away. Um, resolve the neutron star equation to state. So basically, are these neutron stars big and Puffy, are they, or are they really small and compact? Um, we don't know. Um, so that's about all I would say about that. And um, uh, measure the Hubble constant. So cosmologically, obviously, there's the tension between, well, not obviously. Um, there is the tension between the Planck measurements, which measure back using the C and B to the early universe, and then the shoes and the other 
uh, you know, uh, what is it, the cosmological ladder where they use type 1a supernovae to calibrate what the Hubble constant must be. Um, there's a tension on these two numbers don't agree even within the error bars. So what's going on there? Well, we have another way of measuring that constant now through this. Um, so because we're receiving both gravitational waves and light from the same sources, we can get way different information about luminosity distance and uh, what is it, redshift distance. And you compare the two and that basically pops out Hubble constant right there. It's a very clean way of making these sorts of measurements, especially if you know you believe GR, which is telling us that gravitational waves with the speed of light propagate at the same rate. All right, test extreme reason, uh, regions of extreme gravity. So the testing GR is obviously super important to the theory. So we gotta do it. Um, and that will be able to, we'll be able to do that way better with those high SNR detections. So we're getting really close to the event horizon there with these detections. And we're probing into those extreme regimes where those black holes are coming together. It's going to be uh, very, very good for us. So uh, finally, you know, as I said before, measure formation of heavy elements in the universe is very, uh, you know, we're basically going to be able to see back to neutron star detections like the one which must have happened that formed Earth. And so we'll be able to be, look at our own birth in some sense. Um, and then finally measure something we don't expect. You know, some people are putting together quark star estimates, whatever. I don't, we, 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 we don't know what's gonna happen when we first turn on this detector. We do know we're gonna get loads and loads of black holes. We're gonna get lots of neutron stars to be able to you know, um, figure out where they are in the sky. So if nobody has any questions, does anybody have any questions? Okay, we'll, we'll move on. And then if you have questions, you can ask me later. But now I'm gonna move on to the design. So I just told you all the great things that CE is gonna do, right? How, it sounds like magic. But it's not, it's just, it's, as I said before, it's just kind of like scaling up what we have already, what we know already works. Um, and, you know, figuring out what we need to do to make a CE actually work, Cosmic Explorer actually work, um, based on our experiences with advanced LIGO. And so it's overall the same plan configuration as advanced LIGO. It's a power recycled, signal extracted, battery throw, Michelson and Okay, so let's just, uh, Dumb that down for a second. So here we have the laser. It goes through two infant mode cleaners. This is something that we'll talk a bit more about later. I'll speed through those slides. But um, essentially, this laser goes through these infant mode cleaners, which clean the beam to make it frequency and intensity stabilized, and also clean the spatial mode so that it's acceptable to the interferometer. And here's the power recycling mirror. All this does is basically give you a free amplification of the uh, incoming laser. And here's your Michelson beam splitter. Uh, pretty straightforward, the beam comes in, goes up and through. And here we have our uh, X-arm, the fabri Perot X-arm. And so that's what we're always referring to when we refer to our arms. These are the money makers. Uh, this 40 kilometer fabri Perot arm cavity here and here. And they're super heavy, they're super long, they're the quietest. They're, they're limited by quantum, you know, mechanics. Uh, so you know, quantum radiation pressure is blowing them around, and that is like the limiting place. Um, and so these are some of the craziest objects ever created. Um, and so, and then signal extracted. It's basically the same as power recycling, but signal extraction is just when you lock off resonance on purpose. The reason we do that is to broaden the, the range of our detector. So usually you make your resonance very narrow because you put things on, on resonance on purpose, right? Everybody's done this with the resonator uh, here, especially. Uh, but we locked off resonance on this particular cavity for you know, very specific reasons. So we are in the process of finding an optimal corner layout. This is not necessarily what Cosmic Explorer is going to look like. We're trying to figure out what the optimal or like uh, position for all those mirrors are gonna be. Uh, just talk briefly about this. This is a <laughs> this is a poster that Georgia and Trent made. Trent is Georgia's graduate student. Um, but these are the ideas for a corner layout for Cosmic Explorer. And so this is sort of what the you know optical design team. This is like the first you know front and center problem that we have to figure out 
before we can move on, right? Because this is going to inform all other substances. Kind of hard to see, I, I know, but there's basically eight major ideas that we're considering. Um, and I'll, I'll zoom in on one of these in a second. But, um, you know, basically they're all different ways of placing the corner mirrors that actually give uh, something which goes off to the exons. Um, and all of these, we're basically just trying to deliver that beam to the fabric row arm cavities as best as you can. And some of these get pretty nuts. This one is absolutely monstrous, but uh, my favorite is Crab One. So I'll zoom in on Crab One. So here's a loose design of Crab One I made in Desmos. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can click on the link. I don't know about how you guys could do it, but maybe the people on the computer can do it. But um, yeah, like basically just like messing around, trying to put mirrors and spots. And, you know, after a while, we're like, well, how big are these things? Like, you know, because we have a whole bunch of constraints up here. I'll talk about in a second. But it, we, we just wanted to figure out where they can actually go without running into each other. So this has been a pretty useful exercise, actually. So um, there's, the constraints are something like we want to have a very short corner uh, for reasons which are very specific and technical. But basically, the shorter the corner, the more easy it is to make um, the frequency response to the full interferometer as good as we can make it. Um, and so do we want that signal extraction cavity to be as long as possible, uh, short, excuse me, short as possible. You're gonna get mad at me if it's in um, So here's the signal extraction cavity, but it's not just this length that we're worried about, it's actually the entire length to the ITMs, sorry, to the input test masses. And so we have to worry about all of this length, the black, the purple, the red, and the green here for both of these. And they probably should be about the same thing for each. And so uh, that's that's our first number one consideration. So we're trying to find a short configuration here. We want a low angle of incidence on the beam splitter. So for us, thermal aberrations on the beam splitters are a pretty uh, big problem. And it's becoming worse as you go up to higher, higher, higher and higher powers. Obviously, silica, you know, fuse silica is a great material, but as it you know, heats up, you have the high power beam incident on it. It starts to deform slightly. It spoils our perfect uh, beam quality. And in CE, we need perfect beam quality. It is absolutely imperative. It's probably the number one biggest problem we are going to face is making those beams Gaussian as Gaussian as possible. Okay. So this is what we're trying to limit with this low angle of incidence on the beam splitter. When you go through a beam splitter, obviously with 45 degrees angle, the side that gets reflected, this one's fine, but the side that gets transmitted is going to have two spots of absorption. And so that's going to give you some, you know, it's, it's going to spoil your Gaussian beam basically as it goes, you know, through up and reflected off and out. So if you lower that angle of incidence, then that becomes less of a problem because at least the absorption will be sort of along the same axis. All right, oh, wait. Okay, we're not going to make it to the input optics section of this talk, but um, that's okay. Um, long mode matching telescope is required, uh, preferably with uh, no beam splitter. So basically, we at the same time as we want this uh, signal extraction cavity, to be as short as possible, we need a long mode matching telescope because our beams have to be huge. Okay, and so basically, what I mean by a long mode matching telescope is we need to, you know, put as much length into this difference between y and two and y and three here, and x and two and x and three here, as opposed to the other parts of the corner. And so it's sort of like this playoff. You know, so I probably should have mentioned this right away, but the beams coming in on the PRM incident here, then goes to the beam splitter and gets split between these two arms here to, you know, X and Y. And then it goes down into the uh, two arms, which go off to infinity. So these orange ones are our actual arm cavities, right? Um, and so we really need to, you know, think carefully about where we're placing these mirrors, what each mirror is doing, and try to limit uh, problems with um, uh, putting them all together. Uh, okay, cosmic explorer input optics. I literally have like three minutes to talk about this. 
So we'll just do a very loose um, talk about what our big problem is going to be. But first of all, I'll just go over what the input optics look like. So here we have a laser, and it comes in on our first of our triangular cavities. Uh, and so in general, we uh, only have one in the uh, in a advanced LIGO, but in uh, Cosmic Explorer, we need two, or at least we think we need two. And we're, we're working on figuring out um, whether or not that's really necessary, but uh, this is sort of what a loose, really loose design of the Cosmic Explorer optics uh, look like. And these cavities are about 100 meters or 300 meters long, somewhere in that range. We still need to nail down what those are gonna look like. And this is just the output primo cleaner, basically. Uh, but, okay, so what is an input mode cleaner? How many of you guys have seen something like this? One, two, three. Okay, so this is what, you know, a sort of a normal pre-mode cleaner looks like, right? And that's lit in the IR in this case, I believe. And so usually you just have like this little triangular cavity where it in the, in the beam comes in and it gets recycled and... Um, you know, the idea there is that the, the mode inside of that cavity is well defined by the, the curvature, usually of the back in here. And so you know what kind of beam is going to come out of it. And then you can also use it for uh, temporally stabilizing it as well. You stabilize it frequently and intensity. And in advanced LIGO R, uh, well, you can't see, but it's the, uh, you know, IMC parameters, input mode cleaner parameters. Um, and we have a pretty nice smoke cleaner. Um, it only takes right now because we're in. A suspended 16 meter cavity and it gives us a 93% uh, throughput and it sort of does the job. But because I don't have a ton of time, I will just mention what our big problem in Cosmic Explorer, it's, it's going to be those long arms. And so the free spectral range in LIGO is 38 kilohertz, but in Cosmic Explorer, it's going to be 3.8 kilohertz. The problem is that this is now in the detection range. And so now we have to come somehow figure out how we're going to lock our cavity where we have, um, we're, we're using the feedback of the interferometer um, with a beam uh, which is, you know, having uh, a free spectral range, which is in the you know, detection, detection range of the parameter. And I have a whole bunch of slides explaining why this is um, a, solved, a solvable problem, and we can solve it by using two uh, input mode cleaners. You basically, the idea there is to use one with an active feedback and one with a passive feedback. So in this case, you would feed back to the laser like normal to frequency stabilize, but in the IMC2, you feed back to the suspension itself so that the suspension, the IMC2 itself, is following the laser and getting you the suppression that you need in order to deliver a clean beam to Cosmic Explorer. Okay. But since I'm already over time, we'll skip all of this stuff. We're considering different designs and stuff like this and you know, thinking about questions and coming up with noise budgets. Um, but in any case, this is the uh, Cosmic Explorer design team. So we're, you know, it's pretty small at this point, but we're hoping to grow, especially when, um, you know, advanced LIGO, you know, is reaching the, you know, end of its facility life. We want to um, uh, grow and become the next big thing. So that's where we're at. So thanks a lot. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So you mentioned that you need to account for thermal aberration in the beam splitter. Why don't you need to account for those by any of your other like meters right before or after the beam splitter as well? That's a great question. The short answer is that we do. And in fact, it's way more important for the other optics. So going back. Yeah. So for these guys, uh, basically this, uh, the, 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 this is called IPM, the input test mass. And the problem is here, it has two problems. There's a massive amount of power incident on the front surface, and also a pretty high amount of power being transmitted through the substrate. 
So the substrate is basically doing a lot of absorbing as well. And so you have some absorption in here and have a lot of absorption on the surface. So even though these high quality surfaces on the front are really reflective and really nice and deep and polished and all the great stuff, they're still absorbing and it's getting transmitted through it. So you have this double whammy that you have to resolve. And people, we're this, like I said, beam quality is our number one most important problem in Cosmic Explorer, and we're aware of this issue, and we're working on, you know, investigating new materials, investigating other wavelengths, which are more, embed, uh, you know, uh, ambitious uh, solutions because they aren't, you know, tried and true, like few silica is and. 64 is for advanced LIGO. But at the same time, we're investigating you know, actuator systems. It's called thermal compensation. Uh, we're changing the name to mode sensing and control to, uh, I don't know, make it more fancy, but basically same, the idea is the same. Control that beam quality so that the, the, the beam inside of the arm is exactly what we expect it to be. 